Welcome everybody to this episode of the Coach's Corner. We are excited to talk about spear fighting tonight. Uh, so let me introduce everybody. All right, let me get our setup here. Okay, welcome coaches and guests. Uh, we'll go from kind of top to bottom. Uh, Sir Elizabeth from Eldemir is joining us uh, from up our northern ways. His, his Lordship Barry of Anglesey, uh, Sir Pelinor, and Sir Tierlock are joining us to talk about spear tonight. There are a few times on this show where we have taken on subjects and bitten off more than we can chew. And I think that this is going to be one of those episodes. We are not going to be able to talk about everything about the spear. Uh, but we do want to cover some things to, uh, for people to, to get into it uh, who are maybe interested in it or want to learn some more, more of the beginner to intermediate spear fighter, uh, some different things to uh, consider, and maybe some things to give you some new ideas for what to do with practices if you want to start training with the spear. Um, Pelinar, maybe we could start out with you. I think we, maybe we'll talk a little bit about equipment because that is a big thing with, with spears about how, how to configure it. Um, maybe we should just start there. Sure. Um, you've got your choice of a two inch tip or a three inch tip. Most people are doing two inch tips now. Uh, there's, um, you cannot use the, the hard rubber tip anymore that the Mandrake tip. So there are uh, several builds that you can do with the two inch tip. Uh, mine is using a uh, uh, Fernco no hub coupling with, uh, with a uh, two, two inch diameter by two inch long foam tip in it. Um, another thing that I do on a spear, I use a fiberglass spear, by the way, uh, you would want to put a butt cap on the back end um, for something to hang on to with your, with your finger so it doesn't get yanked out also. Um, other things to think about are uh, hooks. Um, I use a, uh, when I have a hook, I use a very small hook because I'm a small guy. It's easy for me to just flip it off. But there are some people, larger guys, like to use a more aggressive hook. So when they hook, they can actually pull somebody around. Mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, what I look for in the spear. Part Some of the things that I look for in the spear. Uh, Something else equipment wise that I like to tell people is use a backup weapon. That way, if you're getting run down, then you have a chance after you've been practicing with it, uh, you actually have a chance once they get past your tip. If nobody's there to help you, you can actually, you're, you can actually defend yourself. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's a whole nother topic on how to, how to do that. You know, as, uh, as I was thinking about this episode and, and introducing somebody to a spear, my first thought was it's a very unforgiving weapon style. Um, if somebody gets past that point and charges you, you 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 do have a real rough time. And and so having a backup weapon, like you said, does give you a chance. I think that maybe the word unforgiving was not quite the right word, but it, it is a, a weapon style that demands precision. It demands precision in your, your movement, your vision, your accuracy, and your ability to read a battlefield in front of you. And I think this is one of the reasons why people who are maybe just inter, uh, beginner intermediate fighters are a little intimidated by t picking up the spear because they, they'll very quickly run into a, a slight misjudgment of range or of a potential threat and they'll have somebody run up the spear on them. And when, <laughs> when that happens, it's usually yeah, time for a good headache. Um, and so it's, it can be kind of scary to, to take on a spear. Uh, especially if you get caught by yourself. So, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about tonight uh, is working as a, as a part of a team because a, a spear is, is not alone uh, uh, good on its own. It really is a team, a team based weapon and, you, and working with a team is, is very important. Um, it's going to be very hard to break this up, but we're going to talk a little bit about about the groups, uh, about how to practice in small groups with a spear to start getting used to it before you get into a large group melees. But I think we want to cover just a little bit more with the, the equipment because I think there's a number of things that have, is very common over the years as people start picking up spears. Uh, and I, I, I agree with the hooks. I was the same thing. I wanted my hook to be so small that my opponents couldn't see it from the other side. Those really big hooks, like you said, if, if you got if you weigh you know 225 plus. You can have a big hook because you can you've got the weight just to you know bring it down and hook but it can be used just as much against you as you as it can be used in your favor 
I've seen a number of spear fighters get hooks hooked and have their spear ripped out of their hands. Uh, I was so I was actually dragged my whole body. I was hanging onto my spear. I was dragged out of the line and into the middle <laughs> into the midfield. It was it was <laughs> it was terrible. And yeah. Um. So yeah, the I like the hook that was so small that I could twist my wrist and release it off of the edge. Now, if somebody had super big uh, hose on the edge of their shield, which was more commonplace years ago than it has been lately, it wouldn't. The hook wasn't big enough to really hook onto it. But I found that uh, the, that small agile hook was, if it was hidden, I could get that opening I needed really, really easily. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about with equipment was, and I'm not sure if these are around much anymore for a number of reasons, but when I started originally with spears, the fiberglass was fairly common, but there were people that still had rattan spears. And I saw them start to kind of disappear because, you know, good firm rattan was kind of hard to get. A nine foot piece of rattan tends to be a little whippy or it's like a, a four by four, the thing it weighs a ton. Um, and I found that that heavy spears uh, tend to be uh, very, they're, they're not very agile. They're, they're hard to maneuver. And that's another consideration. I know that people buy fiberglass spears, there's, you know, the wall thickness tends to be an issue. They have like a heavy duty spear. They've got a meat like a medium and then a very lightweight one. And what I found uh, from people that use the lightweight ones, they like them because they're, they're, they're so agile and quick, but they also break pretty easily. And so, when you're looking into equipment, keep an eye on that. I kind of like the medium uh, ones, medium thickness ones, because they were quick enough to be agile, but they were still pretty durable. I, I don't, I've never had a, one of them break on me, but then I don't use it like a pry bar either. <laughs> so, yeah, um, uh, yes. Yeah, I was going to comment on that. Um, I, I've used yeah, all of ahead. them. Yeah, I've used all of them, and I, I certainly prefer the medium um, weight. Um, one of the problems I've run into with the lightweight. Uh, a couple of issues. One is that um, particularly if you're getting to where like you're getting pretty good where you can spear duel. So maybe this is more of like a, a medium level uh, spear fighter. Um, and when I say spear duel, this is still in the context of a melee, but like I'm across from Bess and we're both trying to get that one kill so we can take out the last spear fighter before we move on. Um, the light ones are really easy to knock offline. They don't have any momentum to carry through. Right. Uh, and some fighters that require a little bit of a thicker shot it's really hard to get them to take it um, with those. Uh, and of course the breaking, I, I do find them nice though for newer, smaller, weaker fighters. And they may just have to rely on getting what I call sort of like the, de the definitive kills where the person sees you hit them in the clear opening. They're more likely to take that or face shots. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's been sort of my experience with the lightweight ones. Um, sure. And they do break. <laughs> yes, they do. Tell them. Uh, I've used, I've used also used all three or uh, weights. Um, the things I found with the heavier ones, just to make a comment on those, is if you, after a while, you got tired carrying them around. But when you did throw them, you really didn't have to throw them quite as hard because the actual the mass of them would keep that shot going and and exert some more force uh, into a person that you didn't have to throw as hard. And they didn't they didn't break as easy either, but lugging them around the battlefield for a long time really got tiring. You know, year, years ago at Appenzik, uh, I remember I was somehow I'd get my weapon and I got separated and I was running around trying to find one. And I grabbed the spear and I picked it up and it was filled with sand. I could not believe how heavy this thing was. And, uh, you know, as I as, first, I was like, how am I going to use this thing for one? Because it's just a brick. But then I thought, who, on, who in the world would would take so uh, this thing have it so heavy that it, it was i mean it literally it was like concrete it was very strange but um tierlock do you have anything to uh to add into the your spear configuration um not really i i i have used all all three of the different ones um i agree with what everyone says the the light ones they fly but they also get knocked offline really quickly um mm -hmm. and like you said, sometimes you got to reach out and let let them know that they've been hit. And I I like the mediums, the heavies. Your arm gets tired. You're just exhausted. They're they're good. They're durable. They last. But yeah, after a while, it, it just they just take a beating. So, 
All right, we do have a number of comments that have come yeah, in. Uh, one, one of which is that uh, somebody is looking for recommendations to where to get fiberglass spear shafts these days. Uh, I remember going to, and I haven't picked up any recently, but going to like pla raw plastic, many, uh, not manufacturers, but uh, like distributor warehouses where they sell all kinds of different plastics was a good place to go. Pelinar. I have, I have purchased from AIN Plastics before, A-I-N. And they sold in, I think it was 20 foot lengths. And they let, they let me uh, right there on the floor, cut it to, to two pieces so I can fit them in my van. Uh, but AIN Plastics is one place that I have gone to as far as a distributor. You can okay. also, anybody can also go to some place like a home hardware or just call them up and ask them. We were asked to show, uh, to talk about a uh, spear. So this is three inches. So it's bigger than most people use. This is a spear cap. A tip rather it goes over the end here's a squishy thrust and it goes over the top like this and it can just be assembled and taped on and that comes i i got this one from munitions grade i'm not saying that you should buy from them that we don't advocate or or recommend any products but i'm just saying that's where i got them from so fiberglass and then at the end i'm going to scare the crap out of my dogs doing this uh well it's not really going to fit but then i have the you know, my grip here i taped it up mm -hmm. and then there is at the end which you can't see right now uh there's a cap and it just protects the end and i take that over too and i'm just going to sit here and uh change ends i have a little house <laughs> <laughs> so here's the here's the other end of my little house so i have a cap on this one and it had some ridges so i taped it up so that uh it doesn't hack up my hands when I'm working on it, and I can feel the end of end of um, when I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on just to the end. So hey, Jess, I want to comment real quick because we're going to talk about tactics. Oh, um, that's sure. a great example of how not to move in and out of other units. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't come to my house and move in and out. <laughs> All right, hey, uh Commenting on the butt cap that that uh, Bess has on the back end. Um, Menard sells the square end butt cap. Love. I think we may have lost. Oh, Pelinar. Pelinar. I think I, I think I know what he was was going for. They make uh, and this was the the butt caps that they sold forever. Was a it was a square ended, uh, flat butt cap. And then you could go to Lowe's. They they started coming out with butt caps that were rounded on the end. And so if you ever started getting bruised in your palm because you were kind of using that that edge was hitting you in the hand those rounded end butt caps were really really good for going easier on your your palms uh if you you know didn't have a side grip you want more, will, more of an end grip i will say up here in eldermere uh, ontario canada i had a hard time finding them i finally found one and i, I really i didn't like it very much it, it had grooves or ridges on it and that's why i taped it up as well as i did uh it wasn't even square it was it was almost octagonal with these weird ass. Oh yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. But they were uh, all I could find. Now exactly. I'm gonna say, sometimes I don't know. you gotta work with what you did. And and I noticed on those on those end the uh, rounded end caps, they did have some printing on there that was raised, but I just filed it off. So it smoothed it all down and then taped over it. It was usually pretty good. I'm so. lazy here. I just wrapped the I just taped the hell out of it. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about in, in terms of equipment wasn't the spear itself as much as um, gauntlets. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I that a lot of spear fighters seem to be tempted to get right away are finger gauntlets, and I would never recommend finger gauntlets ever. Um, <laughs> ever. Like I, I don't care how pretty they are, I don't care how much brass they have on them. Yeah. It, you just cannot get enough protection on your fingers. Uh, and they tend to be heavy because there's a lot of rivets that go into making finger gauntlets. And so when you're, remember, just like with having a heavy spear, with all of that weight flying back and forth, if you add weight onto your hands, it's just like adding weight onto your spear. So be careful about having having your hands, A, be not protected very well, and finger gauntlets just don't do the, don't, don't do the trick as sexy as they are. But also be mindful of the weight uh, that you have going going into them, and that you can get a good grip. Yep, absolutely. Um, 
the other thing I, I think for equipment is also, uh, of course, we this is getting more into the weeds, but also with mobility. And I think with, in my opinion, mobility with a Spearman is a is not a luxury. It's a crucial factor. You have to be able to move around. So if you like your full plate, you know, Henry the Henry the Eighth or Fifth or whatever it is, maybe reconsider how heavily you armor yourself so that you can you can be mobile because if somebody charges you, your your defense is going to be your ability to move. Um, and when you're on offense, if you've got to cover ground quickly and you can't because you're so laden down with your own armor, you're now a liability. Uh, so I, not, not that I'm saying, you know, you need to wear a helmet and, and three pieces of plastic for your entire armor suit of armor, but make sure you're mobile, make sure you don't get caught up. This is one of those things that, that I think every fighter they go through when they get their very first outfit, their first suit of armor. And they find out what well, kind of catches it doesn't really let me move very well you, it, it's a learning process and uh i think spear is one of those uh weapon styles that if your armor isn't working really well with you it's going to add even more problems and and it's going to make spear which is already a very demanding weapon style uh even worse um let's see i think we've got a number of comments in here talking about the uh uh where the where you bought the tips and whatnot uh there's a question about here i'll show gotcha. it right here what about the hook they talked about i don't think i've seen any real standard hook configurations like everybody's got a different take on on how to do a hook um it's going to be just kind of hunt around and see what what people use what you like um if you can borrow somebody's spear if they'll loan it to you try it out see what you think uh and then get them to talk about what why they like the hook that they have and you usually find out that it's suited to their particular style of fighting spear um, and application it took me a while to, to really like a hook myself but once i got into it it was it was really cool um definitely worth a try but um yeah, right. Tristan, yes um i'm a shameless plug right here but uh i i'm the creator of the uh, sca spear tutorial um playlist on um on youtube so anybody's watching go there i've got all the videos i can find mine i put first but i do have everyone else's videos on there too but one of them is a spear construction video and I, this is not for me so honestly if anybody has any other spear construction techniques that they like go in there in the comment section and put links or, or whatever uh, and in there I have how I make my spears and the hook. And just basically the hooks I do is stack a couple pieces of foam, tie them down really tight with strapping tape, and then experiment and pull it on some shields until it works. So, so you're talking. Perfect. Yeah, go check it out. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. What's that, what kind of foam? Uh, blue foam from Walmart. <laughs> That's actually what I make my spears out of. It's, it's not, actually, I really like your spear tip. I've not found one. I mean, I just haven't stopped the munitions grade armor and what I've been thinking about it. But uh, yeah, I do like those. Um, I've just been doing mine for so long that I've, I've stuck with it. You know, with, so with, my, in terms uh, of foam, one of the things that I found that I really liked, because uh, a lot of foam, like if you, like let's say if you pack it in your car and you smush it and then you drive to an event and you come out and it's, it's, it stays smushed, kind of like a hamburger bun. One foam that I found that works really well as a base layer was a, it's a sponge rubber hockey puck and it's three inches exactly in diameter. It's an inch thick, but it's spongy, but it always springs back. It's got a bit of structure to it. So if you have, this was back in the three inch tip days, but you can cut them down into, into smaller discs. The problem with folding over, they don't have that problem as much. So it's, if you did like a layer of that and then a layer of the softer foam on the outside, like on the, the part that makes contact, you've got that really good uh, progressive give but it's also firm enough that it's not flopping over. Uh, yeah, it tends to work really well. And you can get them at just about every hockey store. Pelinar. Nope, you're muted. A couple of things I've used for hooks is just uh, garden hose, kind of set sections of it and stack them up. Uh, also, I've used uh, small bits of leather, whatever shape you want, and just stack them vertically and glue them together and then uh, strapping tape them on. Sure. Just a couple of couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. So, Pell, what glue do you recommend? Because I know we'll be asked. 
Uh, actually, you don't even need to use glue because if you don't use glue, then your your stacks will uh, conform to the round right. the, the around the uh, the spear shaft, yeah, and you just tape it together. One of the things I always do, whether it's my sword or if it's a spear, anything that needs a squish on the end, once I've taped it up, I take a little uh, box cutter, exacto knife, whatever you use for it, and I just put a little slit in the end, and it just lets air in and out a little easier so that it, it's softer, so it's not like it's a, a solid dome of, of foam, which sounds great when you're, you know, you, you're taping it up, you're like, I'm taping this up, and it's going to stand be great. Uh, but just by putting a little slit in there, it just lets air in and out and it lets it compress a little and um, expand again a little easier. Hmm. Cool. I think there's one one last thing to talk about in terms of spear configuration. That is the length. Uh, for the longest time, nine foot was the one and only length. But, you know, then, then we went to, the SCA went to allowing up to 12 foot spears. And I remember, of course, being an avid spear fighter, I had to run right out and get a 12 foot length of <laughs> of fiberglass and what i found initially was the thing handled like a dump truck um it, the, the range was nice but it was so slow and and unmaneuverable and i got the the kind of that medium weight shaft the way that i would normally get those spears but <clears throat> boy i think i used that thing twice and just said you know this is it's it's too unwieldy but if when i cut a foot and a half off it and i made a 10 the 10 and a half foot spear it had almost the agility of the nine footer but it still had an extra foot and a half range and it was great oh you're muted we practiced with uh 10 footers for a whole summer and mm -hmm. then we went to a bunch of us went to an event uh just before penzik and we found that and and they had said only nine foot so we went back to our nine feet so and then every almost every time we threw a spear shot it was six inches short <laughs> so it was like, okay, 10 footers are great, but practice with nine footers. Oh yeah. Yeah. You have to know, you have to know your weapon. Definitely. Um, and with the, you know, it's funny cause when we were bring, I'd only had a couple of these 10 and a half foot spears, but when I bring them out, I'd start to feel guilty because they were such an advantage over, over nine foot. I mean, a, a foot and a half of range on a spear is, is remarkable. Six inches is pretty good. Like if you can get a good six inch advantage, that's solid. But another 12 to 18 is, <laughs> is crazy. Um, but yeah, a lot of events would say, okay, we're gonna only going to do nine foot spears. And what I found is that, you know, unless you had at least 50 to 50 people roughly on a side it, and, and to even them out, they were almost like the combat archer of the spears that if one side had, a, had a 10 and a half foot spear or a couple of them and the other side didn't, it would it would really slant things one way or the other. Uh, that's the other thing about a twelve foot spear. They're pretty easy to spot. You know, when you bring the tip up, it's three feet longer than everything else. You're like, what is that? You know, who brought a tree up here? Uh, but the ten and a half footer, you could kind of hide, and nobody would know about it until it was starting to kill everybody because of the additional range. But um, and of course, you're free to do a ten foot or a nine and a half foot or something like that. But um, I don't know. It's there's only so many spears you want in your spear bag. <laughs> and of course, here at Coach's Corner, we always recommend that you consult with your kingdom handbook and make sure that the materials you using are appropriate to your kingdom and meet all your kingdom standards and specifications. This is regard to the the blue foam comment earlier, but it is super important. Nobody wants to make a, a weapon that uh, you can't use in your kingdom or that's only maybe Pensic legal and you can't. Uh, use it at home. So really make make sure that you know where you want to use your weapon and make sure the weapon that you have will be legal at the place where you're going to be using it. Well, you may not want a thousand. I think nine foots are still the limit for Penzik. Let's ask one of the generals. Pelly? <laughs> He's not a yes. So for example, nine nine foot for Penzik. Yeah, nine, foot, nine foot is, is what uh, is required at Penzik. So there you have it. Nothing longer than nine, even if your kingdom allows it. Uh, nobody wants to bring a weapon only to find it get bounced. So, and I talk pe about Penzix simply because uh, I'm here uh, in Ontario, Canada, Eldemir, and we're at Penzik every year. And so that's our big war. But of course there are other terrific wars. I don't mean to take away from them. Make sure your weapons meet their standards too. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I, 
I think for to a large degree, there's been a good drift towards standardization of weapon configurations. But I remember, you know, 20 years ago or so that, you know, when, when here in North Shield, we live next to Calentir, they've got a, had a whole different weapon configuration requirement. So it was like, we'd have to go through the book. Okay, we're going to Lily's. Now, what do we have to, how, what do we got to do? Change our weaponry up to make sure that it's abides by their, by their standards and vice versa. They'd have to change things up when they came up here. Um, but it was, it is what it is, but it's nice that I really like that, that the SCA went to the two inch tip. I was a big advocate for, for that for a long time. Um, and you know, it, it just, I think it made it, made the spear a little bit more wieldy, like it was easier to maneuver it. Um, and we were talking before the show of most of us were, were fighting before face thrusting came into play before fiberglass spears came in or just about the time that they did, um, you know, before pole arms were allowed to be unpadded uh, before there was a requirement, you know, when there was still a requirement to have them padded. And, and I remember the, the, the application of the going to face thrusting was a huge thing. Um, and it was kind of fun to have non face targets, but we won't get too much into the weeds of that. I think, is there anything that we missed talking about equipment or uh, configuration of weapon? We can kind of start getting in. If not, we can start getting into uh, practices and how to get going with learning spear fighting. Did we miss anything? I think we addressed all the comments. Okay. Yeah, I think so. We, it was very helpful. Um, uh, William Vicente posted up this one. Uh, the Dick Sporting Goods link to the sponge rubber hockey puck. I've found them and even played against sports and just about any any place that have, that sells hockey equipment or hockey gear uh, will have those things. And I thought they were just really cool. And I, I would even cut, you could take a three inch one and you cut one inch circles or inch and a quarter circles and use them as your sword thrusting tips too. And they lasted forever, uh, which was really nice. In fact, I'd reuse them one of those few foams that could stand being reused from tip to tip. So it's really pretty cool. Um, all right, well, let's get on to, to discussing how to learn, learning to become a good spear fighter. And, uh, you know, now we got kind of got the equipment part out of the way. Big part of it is going to be practicing, not just at wars. And uh, Bronis wanted, he, he, this is his big thing. is that you can't go to one or two wars a year or three fight spear and expect to be any good at it. You really need to practice at your home practice, uh, practice it at your own home in order to learn the skills that it's going to take to, to, to be a good spear fighter. And so well, we wanted to talk a little bit about, let's say you have a, a smaller practice like most people do. Maybe you've got three, four people, or maybe a dozen people, but you want to learn how to fight spear there. So, um, one of the things that I think is very helpful, and this is how I learned spears, I actually learned from polearm first, and that is learning to fight with a shieldman. And we would have a small group. We do like four on four melees. If you team up with a, a shieldman as, as a polearm fighter and you orbit around them and you travel wherever they do and you're always trying to work with them, if they're under pressure, you should be hitting whoever's trying to hit them. If you get under pressure and you get rushed, they should be stepping in front to apply pressure to the person that's, that's pushing on you. Getting used to that relationship, I think, was crucial in understanding how a spear fighter has to interact with his comrades or her comrades. Um, any comments on that? All right, let's go with Tierlock. Here we go. Um, that's that something fine. we've actually something we've actually been working on at practice recently, uh, just the other week. In fact, we were working on our communication and just being familiar and just being comfortable having a shieldman and working with the shieldman, not against the shieldman. Um, cause there'll be times in the melees where we want to get up and kill. We want to do our thing and there'll be a shieldman in our way and they always want to get in front of us. And sometimes we don't need them in front. Sometimes we don't need them in front of us, mm -hmm. but it's, it's good to have them. It's good to, be familiar and be comfortable fighting with them. One of the things in our communication was, is learning how to move it. Like you were saying, Tristan is how to move around them and move with them um, mm -hmm. instead of moving against them. Like you're, you're not trying to get away from them so you can kill. You're using them to get you to a more advantageous place. Um, 
and using using the cover that they provide uh, will keep you alive longer. Um, mm-hmm. And that's just something we've been working on in the, in the communication um, of, you know, short, quick commands. And it's it's really helped. Um, it's it's given our shields a little bit more confidence. They're they're not as intimidated being out there with other spears because they're like, our guys are better than yours. I'm fine right here. Mm-hmm. And we love that. It's great. We, oh, yeah. we love the confidence. Along with that, uh, you, you can have um, verbal communication with uh, the spear toward to the shield or the shield man to the spear. Uh, there's also all the nonverbal communications, like a, a, a bump on the side of the shield. He move right. The, he'll know to move right or maybe left. Um, or even if uh, the shield man is watching where your tip is, if you go forward or back, he'll know that you're either you or he needs to move forward or back. Um, the other thing, working with your uh, shield minute practice, it will give you, um, when you work on it a lot, you will get the trust between the two of you and even the other shield men um, that you work with that you can do a lot more with them. They'll know exactly what you're doing or maybe not exactly what you're doing. They'll have a good idea of what you want to do and how to do it and how they can protect you better. Uh, and between you, you get a trust that works really well that you'll find that if you fight with someone else that you don't know, you can't do quite as much as you could with the guys that you practice with. Barry, you had something. Yes, I got a mute button here. Uh, yeah, so if you have um, a small number of fighters that are, that are willing to do a melee practice, uh, that could be four fighters. Um, it could be six or whatever. I find, I think what helps the most are re- any kind of resurrection battles. Um, and if you can have some sort of barriers on the field so that people don't just run off all over the place and break off into singles. Um, and if you can do anything that creates sort of a broken field, I always bring uh, a couple of lengths of rope with me. Even if you just have one fifty foot length of rope, you can put a little circle around the field and we call it a pond. You can't go in and go out. Because uh, what that does is that slows down the fight enough to give the spears a chance. If you just have the single death battles, the, the shieldmen end up running over the spears a lot. This slows down the fight a little bit, and I find it kind of, A, it's a little bit of like a um, like playing your scales slow on the piano first before they speed up, so it gives the spear fighters a little bit of a chance. And B, it more accurately reflects some of the battles you're going to run into. Because let's be honest, if you go to Penzik, you're not going to fight three on three with just, you know, shield fighters across you that can sprint you down. Um, and I bring this up a lot whenever we talk tactics. Whenever I say, what do you do if you have three spears across from three shields? And everyone says, well, the three shields are going to charge. And I say, well, what if they just finished charging? They might be tired and they can't charge for 90 minutes straight if this is, you know, the woods battle. So yeah, so so any sort of resurrection battles you can do and, and mix your teams up, you know, three lives, unlimited for five minutes, however you want to do it. You know, there was an interesting uh, <clears throat> that, uh, battle format that Counter did at Lily's years ago, and I loved it. And th- if you have a small group, and let's say you don't even have any spears, any fiberglass spears, you just don't have the equipment, but you want to learn the same basic teamwork. The format of their battle was a resurrection, single sword only battle. And you, you formed out in lines. If you ever got caught by yourself, you were pretty much toast. And you really had to work with the person next to you. Now, the range is much more limited because you're only fighting with your basic single sword. But everybody should have a single sword that they can use. There's where you start watching what, you're, what the person next to you is doing. If you see a blow coming in that's coming for them, you can block or you can actually use that moment when they go out to strike your your comrade blocks and you are able to strike in that moment. The timing is really the crucial aspect of seeing when you have an opportunity, an opening that you can easily exploit. And the weapon doesn't really matter at that point. Now you're, tra- now you're training yourself to, to build your vision and to, and to watch a line with your peripheral vision, as opposed to getting sucked into using your focus point and then missing the hit that's going to come at you, which you don't see because you're not using your peripheral vision. Um, so it's I th- I thought it was one of the most fun battle formats that and innovative. Nobody had ever done anything like that. And I, I thought it was not only fun, but beneficial. Tell them. 
Uh, something in a small format also that you can do th to help the spearman out is if you have maybe four or five guys, um, you put one, the spearman on one side by himself, then you have whether it's shields or, or spear or whatever on the other side, and they are not going to attack you. Really what, what this is for is working on your vision. Mm -hmm. So what, you, what I have guys do is I'll have uh, the spearman looking straight at the guy across from him in the middle of the other line, but he can't focus on him. You need to unfocus your vision. And then you take your spear and just um, not at full speed or anything, say, I'm hitting a head, I'm hitting an, a leg, I'm hitting an arm, and you're, you're calling out your shots, and you're going to see if, without moving your, your eyes left or right, mm -hmm. using your peripheral vision to open up, see if you can actually hit those, those spots. And uh, what that does is help a, a new spearman not focus during a fight. Keep his, his vision open so he can see those that movement because your peripheral vision will pick up on movement. Um, so what you're trying to do is use your is use your peripheral vision to hit spots. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I think that that new spear fighters often will fall into or they won't even realize right off the bat is that you can do more with your spear than just kill somebody. Um, and this can be one of those things where, you know, maybe somebody, a shieldman's running past you. you there are no targets, but you can plan a, a thrust right in the middle of his shield and pause him for a second or interrupt his run or start to interrupt his charge. Uh, this can be, now, of course, if, you, if he outweighs you by 60, 80 pounds, you might have trouble with it. But you can always use that thing to mess with him. Um, I mean, I remember being caught in lines where, you know, you've got a line of, of closed up shields. You can lay your, your spear on somebody's sword to keep them from having an easy time of swinging at, you know, your own shieldman's head uh, to just start fouling, uh, fouling their, their ability to have an offense. Um, these things can be very useful. And, and I re even remember doing cross charges where you'd see somebody charge across a bridge and you pound them on the shield and knock them off the hay bale. Uh, you know, death is a death doesn't really, you know, so you didn't get a really super graceful face shot on them or, or something like that. Uh, it's, it's also always very useful. You've got a tremendous range weapon that can affect a lot of things around you in, in ways you may not think of right away, right away. Uh, you could also open up a, a shield man for another spear. So you got a spear, two or three guys down oh, yeah. and you're aware of where you each are. I can be uh, pounding on uh, the near side of the shield for me and it could kick that backside out. Mm -hmm. And uh, your your other shield, other spearman will have a, a shot at it. Absolutely, and this that's the crucial part of using that peripheral vision to spot those opportunities. If a fellow spear fighter opens a gap for you, you should be able to hit it within a second. You shouldn't have to stand there waiting for somebody to notice that there's a big opening. Uh, it, sh it should happen in, in quick order. So this is why I say spear fighting is very demanding. Um, it requires that precision. And if you're in the line, you're taking up space that another spear fighter could be there. If you're not getting the job done, you're now wasting uh, opportunity. And so, you know, if you get tired, you can pull out, get another spear in there. Uh, don't waste, don't waste your, the space. And um, I think one of the things I found out the hard way, the first time I, I went into a large format battle and I had a Granted, I had a pole arm, but I've seen the same thing happen with spears is they get so eager that they crowd into the, the back of the shields. And 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 eager shield fighters do the same thing. Everybody wants to get closest to the enemy, but when you crowd each other up, that's one of the things I would, as a, as a commander, I would start watching for is, are my opponents crowding their own line? Because if they start doing that, it, it creates a lot of frustration and discord which you can take advantage of because the minute somebody thinks I'm trapped, I can't go anywhere. They're no longer thinking about attacking. They're panicking about how to get back out. And that that's an easy opponent to face. Um, so reading that type of thing is something that, that that's is important to a spear fighter because it's crucial where he puts himself and when he inserts himself into, or she into a, into a battle line. If you are a waste of space, if you're in the way, get out. You have to get out immediately. Um, but let's get back to talking about, about about practices. And I think it does help even to do like two on two, like a little mini bridge 
where you can start getting a feeling or three on three if you can swing it uh, with that with the equipment or four or five or six to get used to basically dueling on a spear line um and you can do it without shields you can do it with shields if you've got enough people uh, but to have that to feel that breathing back and forth of when the pressure's coming how to how to use that peripheral vision how to how to faint one of my favorites was to turn my helmet where I'd, I'd keep my eye on my, my opponent but i'd turn the helmet so they thought i was looking somewhere else and i'd usually bait them into firing which you could then counter and repost and it would make for a pretty pretty easy kill but it was total head fake uh, literally um, but to get used to those things that's pretty tricky it, it's it's good to be able to, to spend some time on it Terlock. um that was that was one of the things that, that we that we were working on is bridging that gap of unfamiliarity because mm -hmm. if when you're just starting off if, if you're not sure what to do or what you can do um one of the guys i, I one of the, the fighters i was fighting against was he, he was surprised that when i when i shifted to the other side of my shield uh, the person was fighting shield um i i did so in a way that the that he didn't have a shot at me and he looked at me like i've never even thought of doing that i'm like well, yeah, I'm not going to just like turn and stick my head out. Um, and he was, but it, 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 it was that, it was that, that new spear fighter that was like, I never even thought of doing that. Whereas mm -hmm. to us, you know, this is something that, that we just do. Um, yeah. But sometimes, sometimes it's good to remember, you know, that at one time we didn't. And so it's mm -hmm. good to, to, to get to share that knowledge that, that to us might be commonplace, but to others that don't have it. So it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun, you know, going back over and teaching people the ropes basically. Um, and that's, again, that, 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 that's what the, the, the small groups are, are really good for because you don't have to worry about the guy, you know, 20 feet that way and 20 feet that way. It's just the, the two or three people in front of you. And it, it's, it, it, it can be intense. It, it's, it's a great crucible for learning. Um, Absolutely. And it's accessible to small groups. Yes, exactly. So I think one of the things that's super important, I love what we've been talking about. I love that we've been talking about the tactics and it makes me happy. It makes me smile as I hear you guys talking. But I think that one of the things is some people just don't know how to fight a spear. They've never picked up a spear. They don't know what the, how to use it. In the chat, I've posted a link to Earl Baroness's, so that'll tell you how long ago it was. It's his basic, it's a spear 101. Uh, and I would, I would encourage anybody who's never really picked up a spear who thinks, how hard can it be? I'll just take up this long thing and I'll, I'll throw it in the direction of the other guys and I'm going to hit them. I would encourage you to look at Bron the, the video that Bron has got up um, that I put the link to just to see, that, see what the techniques and tactics are. I think that, that learning the basics... Uh, we always tell people when they first come to practice it, when they're new kids, you know, this is how you hold a sword. This is what you throw a sword. This is what, how, you know, a sword works. This is a good blow. This is not a good blow. Uh, and I think it's really important that you practice because of course you have to actually practice doing the thing, but you have to know what the thing is before you can actually do it, which is why I posted the video. I'd like to also address Aya, it makes me laugh that I'm here in this in this spear discussion because Pelly and I are in the same house, uh, Sir Pelimer and I are in the same household. And actually, I fight as a shield uh, with my spear spears beside me with my reach weapons. And I think it's super, everything that everybody has said is super important. But what I'm going to talk about now is for those of us who might want to be a spear and uh, um, a shield rather for a spear in the front lines. Because I'm not going to lie, it's really exciting. As Tristram says, everybody wants to be in the front lines, and we all do. So working with a spear, the same person consistently, whoever they are, you get to know what they like. In our household, I fight primarily with three spears. One of them likes me slightly in front and quite far off on the left. And that's okay. And I, I know where I am. And he'll say to me, Bess, if anything comes from that side, I want you to block it. I'm like, okay, I can do that. Somebody else uh, likes me right next to him, but I stand like shoulder to shoulder, but rather than with a flat shield, I have my shield back slightly. So it's almost pointing at the opponents so he can easily fire um, diagonal shots. So he can go, go in front of my shield. So my shield isn't like this and isn't blocking his arm. 
the other one, God help me, gave me a heart attack whenever we fight together because we'll be fighting and he'll take about five steps in front of me. And what he wants for me is to know that he can be in front of me, that I, I will be there and he can run back and I will fill the hole because he'll run past me and I can fill the hole where he was. And I hate that more than I hate just about anything because it's really hard. Um, but it always comes with a timing. And, and that's one of the things Tierlock has been talking about. You have to get to know the timing of the people and you have to talk to them. And they'll say to me, Spears, please talk to your shields. We're not mind readers. We're, we're here to keep you alive. You get your kills. We get half of them because you would not get your kills if we were not keeping you alive. So when you're working with a shield, I really encourage you, move left, take a step forward. See that guy in the green over there? Don't let him kill me. He's the only one. So really, and talk back and forth. Uh, in my house with the, the guy I mostly fight next to, if I'm killed, damn it, uh, and it's a res battle, I'll run back and there might be a shield next to him. And I have, <laughs> I have very often said, excuse me, you have to move left. I fight next to this man and, and we don't really talk like that, <laughs> like this, he, we don't do that. People are like, what? And I'm like, move left, I fight next to him. But that's okay because these are the relationships you're working with. And then say, say uh, I'm fighting with him. He knows what he can expect from me. He knows that you know, occasionally like I'll cross block to keep him alive and I will say, you know, you're not dead. That was me blocking for you, but that's communication. So for those of you who are watching, who are interested in fighting shields, listen to the other guys talk <laughs> or interested in fighting spears rather, listen to the other guys. If you want to know how to be a shield and fight with a spear, listen to me. <laughs> that's, that's what I got. Hey, if I can comment real quick, I see uh, Eric Nicholson on here had asked a question about um, cardio or, or rather conditioning for spear. Um, oh, there it is. Um, yeah, so I wanted to comment on that a bit. Um, it's something that I do a lot. I'm, I'm actually an old uh, collegiate track and field runner, so I'm very big into, into cardio. I would say cardio is probably the big thing. So any kind of cardiovascular fitness you can get, which could be a uh, you know, rowing machine, walking, um, you know, running, cycling, swimming, all that stuff. Um, but one of the things that I do, um, I don't know if many people do this, but I find it very helpful, is I actually have a spear pel, um, you know, near uh, an elliptical machine. But you can do the same thing outside. But just basically, I'll, I'll do two and a half minutes on my elliptical machine, and I'll get off, and I'll throw 10 shots. And if I do that for 50 minutes, I throw 200 shots, and I get in a 50-minute workout. Um, I find that spear... Telling on the spear more so than probably anything else is actually a decent cardio workout because you can sort of throw them harder than you can, say, a single sword. And if anyone else d disagrees, I certainly I don't want to get anyone hurt um, as long as you're not hitting like a hard tree or a brick wall or anything. Um, the spear, you know, you're kind of moving your whole body into the shot. You're sort of exploding and just 10 shots, even if you just throw 10 shots and rest. Um, and the last comment I'll throw on that is that I like to do that throughout the year unarmored as i get close to a big war i start throwing on some pieces of armor typically my arms and my gauntlets um because even if you have a really strong cardio system your arms are gonna get really tired at war um so i find maybe about six weeks before say like penzik i'll start doing it with my um my arms and my gauntlets on cool I'd like somebody to cut in there <laughs> Yeah, I, and I wanted to jump in too because there's a couple things within this that I really like. Um, <clears throat> yes, it is physically demanding fighting spear, depending on how you do it. Now, my old uh, square brother and I were kind of, were both built very similarly, tall, thin. He tended to go out kind of like a, almost like a berserk. He would be th he'd throw more spear shots per minute than I could even count, but he had really super high cardio. Um, I was not in as good a cardio condition, so I would, I would measure my shots more. I was calmer, more deliberate. Um, you mentioned the breathing, breathing correctly is so huge. We should just do a whole show on breathing. Um, although I it would probably be, be a little dull for, for, you know, the, it wouldn't have a title that would grab people like, Oh, how do I breathe? I breathe all the time. Why do I need to learn to breathe? But 
breathing will make a huge difference in your endurance and your cardio. And yes, cardio definitely helps. Um, what I found, by the way, the, 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 the most bang for the buck that I got from cardio conditioning was called interval training. And you can do this on a bike, you can do it running, you can do it with any jumping rope, any anything that gets your cardio going, go basically for a minute, just as hard and fast as you can, then relax and kind of kind of go easy for a minute and do that for about, uh, I think they recommend 25 to 35 minutes. Um, I remember trying that for the first time, but just prior to a Gulf Wars and I started, my usual training cycle would start in January 1st I'd go through the holidays. That's my time to during the year to kind of kick back, relax. And then January 1st would hit and it was trying. Then it was time to get ready for war. And then, you know, Gulf Wars was in, in March. And I, I did that, I think, four days a week. And I remember going, they had a, a 90 minute or was a two hour res battle. And I said, OK, well, this this should this should test out and see what my cardio did. And I I was still fairly deliberate, but every time I got got killed, I would trot back to the res point and then trot back to the line. So I wasn't moseying; I was going, and I was like, "Okay, I wonder how how long this battle. Maybe we've been fighting about half an hour." So I asked a marshal because I wasn't feeling winded or anything. It's like, "Oh, you know, how much is left?" Was, oh, about fifteen minutes. I like, I've fought for almost two hours straight without really any breaks because of that cardio, and it really did a great job. Um, here, I'll switch up, and here you go. Let's see if I can hide that huge. Depth. Yeah, I want to. I want to comment on that. Uh, that. That's a great story. And and actually, um, uh, this year I went to. Um, we went to a battle in the in the in the in the fall, and uh, Duke Vlad came up to me and asked me if I was taking it easy on the newer fighters out there. And I said, No, I'm not taking it easy at all. Why do you say that? He's like, Well, you're not as effective as I'm used to seeing you. And it really hurt my ego because I realized I'd let myself get out of shape. And um, we're coming up to uh, a big event in the East uh, called 100 Minutes War. And I want to make sure I was in, it's 100 minutes long. So it's basically very similar to the Kendrick Woods battle, plus 10 minutes. Um, and I, what I did, and, and this is for anybody that wants to understand a little bit about cardio training, is it put a plan together, give yourself a window of at least six weeks in advance and decide I'm going to do two extra, you know, two days a week. I'm going to do three days a week. Like you said, maybe a half hour. 30, 45 minutes, whatever you shoot for. I did this deliberately. I increased the number of shots I threw on the Pell every day. I increased the amount of stuff I, I did on my, I was using like a treadmill. If you can do jumping jacks, you can walk, whatever. I did, um, oh, the other thing I want to comment, I put in the in the um, comment section here, there's H-I-I-T, but there's also one very specific called Tabatas or Tabatas. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's a very specific 20 minute workout. If you look that up, it's like you go hard for 20 seconds, you break for 10 seconds, you go hard for 20 seconds, break for 10 seconds. Um, I did that for six weeks and I came into at 48 years old. It's, it was the best fitness I'd ever had for a, a hundred minutes war. So uh, it was, it was the first time, but I didn't have to take breaks out of the line. I just fought until I died and I went back and no resting. So yeah, it, it does make a diff big difference, but you have to give yourself like a good, a good six weeks at least to build up to that and then you know mm -hmm. and you'll get the payoff you know so if you're going to Penzig this year um start now <laughs> you know start in the next couple of weeks and do something consistent for you know every week absolutely there's a comment that came up and i i think really bears it and uh mentioning here and that is that uh practice your squats and lunges spear dueling can easily get you a pulled hamstring if you throw your body into a deep lunge and you're not used to doing them um so good single lunges uh now granted when you get excited you're going to do them as a plyometric they're going to be explosive when you go in your backyard to practice you're probably going to do them more of a night well, was an isometric motion it's going to be slower use those slower lunges to get your your hamstrings and your legs and your hips conditioned so that they start to build strength, then work into plyometrics. Don't just go from the couch to doing explosive lunges or you're gonna strain something. Um, and you don't wanna have it happen at home and you certainly don't wanna have it happen out at a war or, or uh, an event. So, because um, we all get eager, we wanna reach that extra couple of inches to, to land to that, uh, that target that's, that's just a little farther away from us. So we wanna make sure we don't, don't get, uh, don't rip, rip or tear your tendons doing that. 
Um, but yeah, I think that maybe we could talk a little bit about Pell here. I'll see your hand there. Go ahead, Barry. Well, well were you just going to talk about Pelling? Because I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I was that, just talk about Pells and targets. Yeah, well, well I was just going to comment that. Um, so we talked about uh, like cardio fitness. Um, and I think the thing that gets missed, we, we talked about this before this meeting about how Spear is a weapon that is fairly easy to pick up and have a little bit of success pretty quickly. And people underestimate and think that it's an easy weapon. And whenever I hear someone say, oh, I think Spear is really easy. I say, well, I say one of two things. If I'm being haughty, I'll say, go stand in front of me and say that. But if I'm going to be more humble, I'll say, go stand in front of Sir Pelinor and say that. Or go stand in front of like, you know, Mr. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, find, find like a really veteran spear person. You're going to stand in front of them and they come back after the fifth time they one shot you and tell me how easy it is. It's easy if there's not a lot of good spears on the other side uh, mm -hmm. or not a lot of archers. Um, but I can't stress that it's not difficult to pick up a spear and hit a target that's across from you with a relative degree of accuracy. But much like it's easy to pick up a drumstick and hit a drum you can practice that for 40 years and you'll never be Neil Peart or Keith Moon. It's, you can keep doing that every day and you're, you're, you're developing these little fine motor skills that make you quicker, more efficient, more accurate. And what's nice is when you get out in the battlefield, you don't have to think about that part of the game. It's like when you see a Duke, when you watch Duke Sean, you know, throw his flat snap, he doesn't think about it, it's automatic. You want the same thing with the spear. You wanna be able to see an opening, hit it before the opening closes, move on, shout some commands, yell at best to get out of your way or to come <laughs> run and save you. You say get out of the way, but now you're saying run, come and save you. Um, yeah, so I, I can't stress that enough. Absolutely. Dalinar. So one of the things that I did to get uh, a lot better was um, I'd use it in every fight, any fight, whether it was two on two, three on three, even one on ones. Um, to get good, you do it. You do it all, and you just keep doing it over and over again in different situations. Mm -hmm. uh, some people would say, "Well, you're you're nuts for doing that," but that's part of the reason why I got better was just using it all the time. It's the immersion technique. Yeah, immersion method. Yep. Um. All right. Yeah. So the uh, that it it is. Yeah, people do underestimate. This, this the skill of a spear and i i have this with my students when i teach martial arts as well i'll demonstrate something and i'll i'll look at them they'll even say all he did was step and did do one move and that, that's so simple that's easy like i'll, I'll get like, i've got this and then they stand up and they don't even know which foot they should move or the, the, the body's all coming out of whack just because something appears to be simple or it appears to be easy doesn't mean that it is if you know you can watch Stevie Ray Vaughan play guitar and think, oh, look at that, he's barely even awake. You know, he's doing this so effortlessly. It's got to be easy, and it's not. I mean, and I, that's a more complex. I think him playing guitar is more complex than than fighting spear. But don't look at a spear fighter who is relaxed. He's managing his energy, but his eyes are constantly watching and studying. He understands range. He's reading the battlefield. He looks like he's just standing there, but he's not, or she's not. And that is that is something that can be easily overlooked. And and I think a lot of people, and myself included, when I first picked up a spear, I was like, okay, I can go do what, what I see all these other people doing. And it was it, it was the, the idiot pounding on a drum. <laughs> it was not Keith Moon. <laughs> um, it's like, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. So it took, it took a while to learn. So... When I first started, probably the one thing that I did wrong a lot was I'd be up there in the front line and I'm spearing and stuff. And all it's the, the guy on the other side is just a little bit farther away. I'm thinking, oh, I just need to move forward a little bit more. I'm getting excited. Right. Mm -hmm. And all at once I'm in front of the guys that are supposed to be keeping me alive. And then I get killed mm -hmm. and I go back and I resurrect. And I come back. I'm fighting again. All it's excited. I start moving ahead. I do the very same thing over and over again it's probably one of the things that that got me killed the most when i was a, a new fighter so i i after a while i just told the my shieldman bass etc let me know when i'm getting too far out you know stop me from from doing that so mm -hmm. and they did so that that 
kind of rein me in some. Oh, whoops. Here we go. Turlock. You're muted. There we go. Um, the, the, uh, again, that falls back on the communication um, and the and the familiarity that you have with the people that you know. And a lot of times, we're not going to be familiar with the people that we're fighting next to. Uh, mm -hmm. Things things go to hell. Things go sideways, and we end up with someone we've never seen before. Um, which is one of the things we, we we've been working on is the the sharp commands like switch. I'm going here or go left. Just something like that. Um, and just like with Pell, I would do the same thing. I would get, I would be like a happy puppy. I'm out there just, just trying, trying to win the battle all by myself. And sure enough, I'd take a shot here and just go storm back to camp. Um, we've all done it. We, we will continue to do it. Um, and, but being, knowing what your weakness is, especially, you know, spear or in, in any style. Um, or in anything and knowing what you have to work on um, is definitely a big step and it, admitting that is, is 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 also very important when you pick this up you're gonna you're gonna be bad at it it's okay we we all are we all were um, and just being familiar with 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 what you're doing definitely goes a long way I have uh, uh, on one of my, again, I will plug my uh, SCA spear tutorial on YouTube playlist. I did link it um, a couple of uh, posts after best uh, linked it to Brannis, who's not here. So I think I should be able to post mine up there. Um, I have my general rule of thumb, my these thumbs right here, um, for how long it takes to get good at spear. Uh, this is a very generic thing, but just to give you sort of a big picture, I think you can pick up a spear and throw 100 shots and to start feeling comfortable with it. Somebody throws 100 shots of spear, I, I would feel comfortable throwing them out of practice. I think they'd have no problems with it. Um, I say more like 1,000 shots to get to competency, which really isn't that many. You know, If you figure it takes about a, a minute to throw 10 shots, that's 100 minutes, that's an hour and a half worth of practice over the course of however many months. Um, and then I say about 10,000 shots to really be what I consider a good spear fighter. And then 100,000 shots gets you into that sort of true veteran spear god status. Um, it would, might sound like a lot, but if you're practicing consistently two to three times a week on the Pell, you can get there in four or five years, um, you know, which I think is still one of the quicker forms than you know how long it takes to be a, a true, like, you know, probably, I don't know too many Dukes that got there in five years, you know, winning crime with sword and shield. Um, but again, I use that just to kind of give you an idea of a, you can get on the field and be pretty good fairly quickly, but there's so much further you can go from there. And it's just a matter of being consistent. Um, I had a, a fighter who's in my household now, but I met him uh, about eight years ago. And I, he had some talent, seemed to enjoy spear. I said, look, every practice you come to, um, you know, just one session, just I'll bring a spear, you bring a spear, we'll just do one, one you know, five, ten passes of spear dueling. And then every event you bring it out there and he ended up getting his, uh, his GOA in probably about five or six years. Um, he was sort of a multi-weapons fighter, but he was quickly one of the best spear fighters in the region. And I think a lot of people noticed that and a lot of people loved having him on their team. Um, and, but, but you have to put the work in, you can't just pick up the spirit war. True. You know, we started kind of talking about <clears throat> practicing and when you talk about doing 100 shots, you know, whether you're doing them a day or how do, how do you practice at home? One of the simplest and cheapest, easiest targets that I, I came across, which I thought thought of this, but it worked really well is, uh, and I'm not sure what if people have these around. We have a, up here called Fleet Farms where you go and buy, you can buy all kinds of different stuff, mostly made for farms. And they had these, I think there were three quarter inch fiberglass fence posts and they were about four feet long one end's tapered so you just drive it into the ground and you'd run wire on it i bought two of them i staked them in the ground about a foot and a half from each other and i put electrical tape marks up them well when you hit it it wobbles back and forth so it's now starts to move so you start static and you would basically just aim at one of the one of the tape marks on it so that would be leg shot hip body face uh it, then they weren't tall enough to get to a face but however you'd want to do it. 
then you hit it, it starts wobbling and moving. You go and hit the other one, it starts moving. Then you go back to the one that's still wobbling. So now your eye's tracking a moving target. And I've heard of some uh, other spear fighters that have gotten, one of the configurations I remember hearing about was they'd hung, hang a rope. And I think they hung like tennis balls about every foot down there. So they hit it, the rope starts swinging and the balls are moving all over the place. And and uh, if you can hit moving targets regularly like that, you will have tremendous point control. And that's a one way to practice, a couple of ways, ideas to set up a Pell specifically for spear. One of the things, my, when my uh, kids were younger, they wanted to help me train with spear. Mm -hmm. So I would have them take a ball. <laughs> so you uh, used your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Run, uh, Johnny, run. <laughs> <laughs> I would have them take a, a, a tennis ball or something that, that bounced really nicely and have them bounce it high and have it come towards me slowly. So you've got a high arc with a short, uh, short distance. And my job was to track that, hit it and hit it back to them. So not only did I have to track it up and down, but as it was coming towards me, I had to use my footwork mm -hmm. to move forward or back to get the, get the shot that I wanted to hit it back to them. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to, that was, helped me with uh, my eye hand coordination or eye spear coordination. Sure. I'm going to be a bit of a contrarian here. Um, I've never been a fan of the moving targets. Um, so obviously we have some great spear fighters here that, that have gotten something out of the moving targets. So I'll, mm -hmm. I'll at least leave this up here. Some methods, some people are going to like better than others. I've always been a fan of a static target and instead you move yourself. So I'll point away from something and then try to hit a static target over here and then back to this static target. Um, mm -hmm. the, the fear I have with the moving targets is that people get a little bit too much of like trying to, to stare at what they're trying to hit and then eyeing into it. Um, and then some of their technique can go away. Um, I like to think of it more like exploding like a shot putter and trying to hit something really fast. And I'd rather be able to do it without looking at it. Again, that's my philosophy behind it. This could be like my fighting shield leg forward versus sword leg forward and sword and shield. So I'm not saying that that my method's the better method, but I'm uh, if anyone doesn't like the moving targets, you don't have to do it. Or if you do like the moving targets, maybe it works better for you. But that's just some, some things to think about. Sure. Now, one, one thing that I do want to say, if you're going to start spear, don't start on moving targets. Move You do static targets first. Um, get to the point where you are hitting them reliably, and I'm talking 19 out of 20. You should and not hit a mark. Don't just aim for some big, you know, center mass, and and you get six inches here, there, or the other. Really put precision points on there that you're aiming for. It's going to be a, a good way to do it. Uh, I do like having several targets, like uh, like Eric Barry was talking about, where you're changing your angle, because that is something you're always going to be doing in a spear line is changing your angles. Um, another thing that I like to do is. Uh, actually run by your target and fire on while you're on the move. Don't assume that you're always going to be in a static line where you're planted and you're, you're like in it, like a, uh, in a bridge battle, for example, because if you want to take it and there's very little that's as challenging as fighting nine foot spear in an open field. Uh, you know, if you ever get separated, you better fire on the move or even if your units on the move and they need you out front, because you run across, a, and this is, you know, reading the battlefield, which is you come upon a unit that's pretty static. You can go up and start engaging them and taking people out because they're not moving. They're not a threat to you until they start moving. And so this is where, and I think somebody in the, the, the comments mentioned that Outlands, uh, they like to have their spears out front. And Outlands have got some remarkable spear fighters, some of the best out there. And they use them very aggressively because they are so good and they can fire on the move uh, very effectively. So that's something that you can practice at home to be able to be, be moving and, and, and simulate the field. Um, I think one real key we, we, we want to make sure we don't miss is uh, make sure that whatever you're hitting with a spear doesn't hurt you uh, for your Pell. Um, mm -hmm. I, so that, that thing that's right behind Best there, the Bob, we, we call ours... We call ours the angle bob. So I have an angle bob in my garage. Um, and again, you can have different weights uh, in the in the in the base to have it wobble just enough. Um, if you have your standard pal that people make out of like two by fours with some weights on the bottom, play around with. Just make sure it gives enough 
so that it, it, it bounces back. So you can hit it again, but not so much. It's hurting you. We had a fighter, went to a local practice years ago and had a very bad experience. Um, uh, the night there, um, it wasn't really a spear fighter and suggested hitting like a big oak tree and she ended up hurting herself uh, after one practice because she was really leaning into the oak tree. So, and also all those like little joints and your techniques are going to get better over time. So start off maybe not hitting so hard and let that build up. Um, just spear pelling can be very forgiving compared to single sword, but you can still hurt yourself. So definitely mm -hmm. work into it and, and be careful with that. I want to go back to something Barry said about uh, being explosive when you're when you're practicing. Yeah, uh, something I've noticed in the last several years. Um, when I was asked about how can I be better, uh, is e explosive when you when you're throwing your your spear, be explosive at the beginning. What I've seen is some people or newer fighters will tend to start slow in their thrust and then get faster as they go along because they think they need to get faster as they go along and what happens is if you start slow and, and keep uh keep throwing you can't necessarily control your how hard you hit at the end or maybe where you're going to hit at the end but if you explode at the beginning you're already already going as as fast as you want to go by the time you get halfway there and then on the second half of your throw you can either slow down if you need to, or control your control your speed, your power, or even where you're going to hit a lot easier when you're not trying to uh, overpower or speed up on that second half. Um, so start explosive, and then in your second half, control where or what you're doing. That's that's a good point. One of the things, and, and I think this is a universal, regardless of what martial art you're practicing, is speed will hide your mistakes it will mask them. It won't eliminate them. It'll just make it so you don't notice them very much until that you, you either miss or something goes catastrophically wrong. And when it does go wrong, you won't know exactly why. So I would, I would second that as say, practice slow and smooth. You don't have to be explosive. In fact, you shouldn't start explosive. Let speed be the last thing that comes in. And one of the, one of my favorite analogies is if you ever watch somebody uh, like a typist, for example, you learn to type, you don't start by blasting your fingers all over the keyboard and then having gobbledygook come out and then have to backspace all the way through it. You practice as slowly as you can be accurate. Use that same method for point control. You'll learn smooth. When your body learns smooth, it will learn to become efficient and you, you'll start to feel what, what's going wrong and, and how to fix it. As you become smooth and consistent, your body will naturally just start doing it faster, just like it naturally would start, you'd start typing faster or doing a 10 key uh, data entry type thing. Um, let the speed come, don't force, don't force that speed. Uh, and I know we've talked about this even back to, I think one of our first episodes was the, the need for speed. And it's so easy to, when we get fighting that we get excited and we wanna go faster and, and wanna really push it. But when you're training, when you're doing it on a Pell, aim for accuracy and smoothness above all above everything else and oh, wait, no, no coincidence no coincidence you said need for speed on the night that top gun came out <laughs> snuck that in there very good catch um but yeah i think in, in this uh, and i was victim of this back you know when i started pels way way back you know you'd go after that pel like it was your worst enemy you just start pounding on it you try to go fast and and it was just, it was all wasted time. It was it, just a mistake. Um, so learn learn from experience about how to take advantage of your training tools and use them to the maximum advantage and, and not waste your time. Yeah, uh, one thing I want to tie back to earlier, you talked about um, how you spear and talking about energy conservation versus um, how you can sort of exhaust yourself. Um, one of the things I've worked with our younger guys, um, our younger fighters here, um, is if I have a young fighter who, let's say they get to that like level, they, they've got a certain level of competency and they're standing there and they're waiting for the open shot before they throw something. And I tell them it's never going to come. You, you, as a spear, just start throwing something. If you can't find something to throw within 10 seconds, throw it something because maybe that'll open up something for someone else. And they say, but that's not what you do. I say, well, I'm a lot older than you, so I can throw 
fewer shots, but I hit more of my shots. So there's sort of different styles out there. So yeah, I've, I've found myself in the last, you know, five, 10 years or so of not throwing a whole lot of shots, but everything I throw, I try to make count. Like I prop, if I had to guess right now, and again, we're not comparing, you know, prowess level here, but I, if I had to guess, I would probably not bother throwing a shot unless I thought I had at least a 50% chance of it hitting. Versus if I've got a young athletic person who's in their, in their twenties, I don't care if you throw a hundred shots and you only land 10 of them. If you've got the energy, go ahead and throw them. Um, so there's a little bit of that, you know, if you've got the energy, use it. If you've got, you know, if you have a little bit more skill and know sort of when to use it, use that. And then sometimes I think the two next to each other kind of create like a nice balance. You have someone that's throwing a lot of shots. They're sort of drawing people to fire in and then the more veteran fighter can sort of, you know, find the counters and read the patterns and stuff. So just, just something to think about there. Yeah, those are good points. You know, and, and I go back to the point I made earlier, which was, and I, I was like you, if it's sick, every time I throw that spear out there, it better be doing something productive. And for me, it's about 80, 75, 80% chance I'm going to land it, or it's going to have some notable effect. Maybe I hook a shield, maybe I pin somebody's shield, maybe I pause a shieldman from coming forward, maybe I just push a shieldman back and create a gap in his line that others, my, my fellow spearmen can do crossfire into. But every time I, I bring that spear, engage it, it's going to have some effect on what's going on, even if it's a good feint. And uh, I kind of like skittish spearmen for that, because if you can, you can kind of twitch and, and look like you're going to lunge and they go jumping back and they, they now left an opening for their, the person next to them, then I'll take that. Um, you know, there's a, there is quite a bit of that. And there's one thing I did want to mention too, in terms of form. And I really, if there's one thing I wish I would have learned much earlier was don't lunge forward with your body first and then extend your spear. I fought this way for the longest time. What I found was more efficient. And this even is referred back into some of the medieval fighting manuals I've seen. You extend the weapon first and then drop your body into it to add the power. And the, the reasoning here is that if you if you have your spear back, which most people keep the backhand, you know, kind of behind their hip, so that the tip is retracted, let's just call it retracted, and you 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 bring your body forward. Well, your body is a pretty big object. It's fairly easy for somebody to see that thing moving. They see your front foot pick up, they they can they they get a sense for it. But if you aim that that tip right at right at them, and the tip starts to come forward, they don't see your body moving at all. They see the tip but it's only getting a little bit bigger, which is very hard to pick up. It's a smaller tip compared to the size of your body. They don't see your body moving. That tip can get almost halfway to their face before your body comes into, into play. So your the spear gets halfway there before they even read movement. So you use that to your advantage to kind of hide the, hide the shot. Um, uh, Barry, you've got something on that. Yeah, it, that's actually something that's fascinating. Um, I had many long talks with, I don't know if you guys know Duke Edward out of the, Duke Edward the Gray out of the East. Um, he's a big proponent of the power chain. And I find what you just described, which is what I like to do as well, is the opposite of the power chain. So our power chain is generating, uh, you know, your ankles and your knees and your hips and your arm. And it's almost like a whip action where you're getting your body moving first and then the sword follows. Mm -hmm. um, what we're talking about here is almost the opposite of getting that spear to move first. And then I like to think of it as everything comes together, but yes. the spear and your body and everything lands at the same time. And through these discussions, what we believe we've come to is that it's a little bit easier to generate a telling blow out of a spear. And also, we're talking about East Kingdom and Atlanta around here where they really want some hard shots, you know, in their in their big tourneys and stuff. Um, so a spear, I think, is a little bit easier to land a telling blow, particularly if you land with your body into the shot and you sort of really ground out and finish that shot, that you can sort of sacrifice a little bit of power for that, uh, what did you call it again? Like that um, sneakiness, the, the speed, right. get that tip mm -hmm. in there uh, and to hide your shots. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to say that because I've seen a lot of newer spear fighters that will take a really big step first, cock their hit, load everything, and then throw the spear into it. Um, oh, exactly. Actually, let me add this to it. 
when I get new spear fighters, one of the, the drills I'll do with them is I'll have them throw a spear shot at me. I'll stand there either with my spear tip on the ground or I'll have no weapon at all. And I say, all you have to do is hit me. And what I do is I just move out of the way when they throw. And I'm trying to train them to learn how to hide their shot because what they do at first is they do a big windup, the big snaggle puss, you know, exiting stage left windup before they throw their spear. And I just step out of the way. And they start to see how quickly I can tell they're going to throw a shot. And usually within a couple of minutes, they start to learn how to get that spear out a lot more quickly. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to drive point, especially if there's any veteran knights that are like sword and shield experts and they have to teach spear, they're trying to learn spear to understand that that power chain issue sometimes can be reversed on the spear because of what we're dealing with. Right. And by the way, this, this is the same thing uh, that happens in boxing where you can, if you, if you lean in and then throw your jab, the body shift is, is easier to spot. But if the, if the arm comes out, you don't need any power up until the time the glove almost is, as at the target, then the body drops in. Just like you said, it's all in the timing of when the power comes in. And since you don't need power from rest position to just before you hit the target, it's the timing of that. And this is kind of goes back. If you practice a hundred percent intensity on your pal, you'll have a hard time feeling when you're moving the weapon versus when you're letting your body shift or the drop step come in there and allow your body to fall into it. When you do it slow and smooth, it'll you, it'll be obvious. It, you can tell what's moving first and then where the power is coming in. Um, Pelinor, did you raise your hand? Who, who raised yeah, their hand? I did. Okay. Yep. Thought that. Uh, that's something that hasn't come up yet is uh, as you're practicing, practice both right-handed and left-handed, because there are times in a mm -hmm. in a uh, melee that you may not have a good shot from from a, a right-hand position, but if you switch mm -hmm. to the other hand. It's a different angle, and you may have a, a perfect shot for whatever. Uh, maybe you're on the edge of a bridge, one side versus the other. That it would be advantageous to be able to switch to the other, to the other hand. Absolutely. Uh, we have a comment here with a question I, I, that I'd like to cover. Uh, it says, "Can you talk about balancing the need for throwing a lot of shots to be a threat versus conserving energy?" I noticed that a line of shields have an expectation that that spears should be firing 100% all the time, but that can get tiring fast. Um, you care to address that? Sure. Um, I, uh, the young guys can throw a lot more than I can, uh, a lot more shots, and it's uh, it's a uh, it's an endurance thing. Uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, if you can mix up people that can do that and uh, somebody that can't throw that many but are more accurate, I think uh, Tristan, either you or Barry, said something about it. Uh, one guy's going to open up shots uh, where mm -hmm. the other one can take take advantage of that. Um, I don't think so. I don't think everybody needs all spear fighters need to be doing that, but it's a nice mix to have something similar to that. Absolutely. You know, one of the things too is think about non obvious targets. I remember. You know, back before face thrusting was allowed, you know, heads were wide open. It was hard to hit things. But as soon as what, one of the biggest things I noticed is once face thrusting came in and all those shields rose up over the, uh, uh, you know, up over the nose, suddenly legs became opened. When you take a line of fighters, say maybe 10 or a dozen, and you leg two of them, that unit isn't really going anywhere. That You've now slowed everything down and you've gotten two people in the way of everybody else. So... And this is where having your Pell have low targets, high targets, different angles. You're going to find that if you can open your mind and just stop thinking you have to land a face thrust every time you, you, you throw your spear, you can hit things like arms, shoulders, legs, hips, and, and vastly affect, negatively affect your, your opponents by, by wounding them. So think about that one too. Other other non-obvious targets is second row, second rank guys. Yes. So many times I've thrown a, a shot past or over the shield, but next to a guy's head, and he's thinking, oh, it's not going to hit me, but I hit the guy behind him, mm -hmm. whether it be a commander or a spearman or pullman, whatever. Um, another thing to think about is if you're a short guy, maybe get down on your knees, get those angles from from underneath. Or if you're a tall guy, you've got you can go overhand with your spear and, and get those tall those high line uh, spear shots. 
those are things that that people don't from the other side may or may not think of either. Yep, and I, I thank you, uh, Eric Mickelson, for for posting this up. There's a fantastic video with uh, Michael J. White, and he's explaining about leading with the weapon. And he, and he comes from a boxing martial arts background, and he describes it so well. Uh, there's a link here in the in the comment, but just look up on on YouTube, uh, Michael J. White and Kimbo Slice. Uh, they were on the set for a, of a movie, and they were, you know, off by the trailers, and they were talking about boxing and and whatnot and and there's two parts to it there's uh video in two chunks but he really describes the optical illusion that happens when a weapon comes right at you and he's talking fists but the spear is the same thing it, it applies exactly the same way so i'd highly recommend uh watching that video um wow okay we've sped through this boy there's so much more we could talk about with spear uh how about we just go through i'll have each person just go through and have some basically some wrap up thoughts and then we'll wrap up the episode. Eleanor, since you're on, we'll start with you. Uh, if, if you want to just get out there and do it in every application you can, uh, practice with the guys that you trust or gain that trust with guys that, that you practice with. Uh, that's probably the one of the things that are two of the things that'll get you the farthest in, in my mind. Cool, and then we'll do Tierlock. Yeah, just echoing what uh what all of us have been saying um get out get in the dirt um have fun with it um don't be afraid to make mistakes um and the the trust that you pick up with your with your fellow with your fellow fighters is going to be is going to increase your confidence and it's going to increase your ability to do more stuff and it's going to give them just as much confidence um, because now they're like, no, no, I'm, I'm good. My spear is going to keep me alive. And that's, that's a bond that's really hard to shake. You find someone you work with and you, you'll see them across the field and you're like, I'm going there and I, I'm going to live and y'all are in a lot of trouble. And that's, a, that's a great thing to find, but seriously have fun. Spear's a great weapon. Um, uh, best weapon there is. Amen to that. Best. Practice. You know, I, it's it's dull, it's boring, it's repetitious to say what everybody else has said, but really it's the way to go. And practice at practice. Try the stuff you've never tried before. That's what practice is for. You don't have to be the king of practice every time. Just go out and try, try the weird stuff that you've never done. Try using right-handed and left-handed. Just give it a go and see if you like it. It's, it's an awful lot of fun. And then Barry. First of all, shout out to my night store, Bill, who's watching. How you doing? Thanks for supporting. Um, no, I want to say uh, I, Spear Spear is a wonderful weapon. Uh, one thing that we kind of didn't get the chance to uh, – he's commenting right now. One of the things that I, we didn't get the chance to talk about um, is the camaraderie that Spear fighters have on the battlefield, and especially now that I've, I've met these fighters right here, I know at some point I will get to recognize their armor. And, and you get it, you, you walk across the battlefield and you see them and it's almost like in the movie Enemy at the Gates with the two snipers that know each other is there and you're watching out for each other and, and little stories go back. You'll find out later, someone says they saw you in a battle and they were going after you or trying to avoid you or whatever. And I don't think there's any other weapons form that has that kind of camaraderie. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's a really beautiful form and I, I hope you guys love it. Uh, those who are watching or yeah, veterans are trying it out new, so. That's all I got to say. Practice, practice, practice. Also, SCA Spear Tutorial Playlist on YouTube. I also have the Duke Branos videos uh, on that playlist that Bess posted earlier. And uh, that's how I got started. His Spear 101 had inspired me so much. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Um, the only two points I want to I want to end on, and that is uh, I want to bust the myth that Spear Fighters are kind of the rock stars of melee they're not now i to me because i like the team play i'll always watch out for my spearmen i'm always watching the battle to see that i can come in with pressure when my spear when my shieldmen are being are being overwhelmed or are being threatened like i'm very assertive very, to the point of being aggressive that way and you know i know it's it, it as you look over a battlefield and you see, you know, shield line with pole arms or great swords behind them, and then you see a bunch of spear fighters standing back, you know, looks like they should have a pitcher of margaritas 
you know, in the backfield, it can seem like they're, they could, they are detached. And that, to be fair, a few are, but generally what they're waiting for is to see their time to go in. When is it time for them to take up space in that line? A good experienced spear fighter will not get in any, in their other fighters way when it's not their time to go in. But when it is, we will be there and we will be pounding over your heads into, into the enemy. Um, the second thing I wanted to, to wrap up with is, yes, the practice can seem very boring, but I promise you it will pay off in spades when you go out on the battlefield. And, uh, you know, we've, there's within the martial arts, there's the phrase cry in the dojo, laugh on the battlefield. Absolutely take that to heart. Just know that the more you practice and the better you get, the more comfortable you get with that spear, being able to hit things while you're moving, while they're moving, while you're exhausted, all that stuff pays off when you can see what you can do against live opponents. So never underestimate or, or get bored too quickly by thinking, well, this is just not exciting enough. Uh, it'll pay off the same way that uh, building that cardio will pay off when the time comes. Um, if you're huffing and panting because, you know, oh, I should, I should have watched fewer movies and eaten fewer pizzas and I should have been working out more. That's not the feeling you want to have in that res battle. You want to be charging around like a, you know, like a mad hen, just loving every minute of it because your body's prepared, your mind's prepared and you're ready to go. So definitely get in, into there, into that training zone and, and enjoy it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on the show tonight. Thank you for joining us live. Uh, this has been a, a great talk. We've only scratched the surface. We've, we may have to do an advanced spear discussion because uh, I know Barry's got a great page talking about uh, with diagrams about how units configure, where the spears come in, when they come in, different uh, ways that they they deploy and, and take advantage of opportunities. It's really fantastic. And unfortunately, we just didn't have time to cover it at all with uh, on this episode. So Thank you, guests, for coming in today and, and discussing this. Uh, Spears, close to my heart, so I, I love this one. So this is a lot of fun. Thank you all. All right. With that, we will wrap up the episode. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, if we did not get any questions answered, we will uh, try to get them in the chat on Facebook. So thanks for joining. And until next week, take care. <laughs>